got us. Look like it's gonna work for me. Resignation.
database featuring the Sultan of Swag. One more time for them, y'all. Yes. And now we're going to have a, a spoken word piece done by a beautiful <clears throat> black woman by the name of Na Akua. So y'all please put your hands together for her right now. <laughs> the darkness that sits in the hallway of my mind. Praise the stop and go and stop and go that I have been through most of my life. Praise the poetry that will never leave me. Praise the poetry that will never leave me. Praise the art of healing that wants to speak through me. Praise the art of healing that wants to speak through me. Praise my breath and my circumstances. Praise my breath and my circumstances, because as long as I have breath, I will overcome my circumstances. Praise the confidence that still lingers. Praise the confidence that still lingers because you are still near. Praise this body. Praise this body. Praise this body. Praise this black body. Praise this black body. Praise this black body. Praise the black bodies of my sisters. Praise the black bodies of my brothers. Praise the black bodies of my trans sisters. Praise the black bodies of my trans brothers. Praise these scars. Praise these scars. Praise these scars. Praise this past. Praise this present. Praise these tears. Because you are still here. Praise the children that see our faults and do not want to repeat them. Praise the lies that catch our tongue. Praise the karma that we learn from. Praise the chances and opportunities because you are still here. Praise the chances and opportunities because you are still here. Praise the memories of the ones who are not here. Praise the memories of the ones who are not here. Ashe. Praise the rituals. Praise the passed down traditions. Praise the knowing of what you should and shouldn't keep from passed down traditions. Praise love. Praise love. Praise love. Praise love. Please love. And then praise love. Praise the one who has vowed to show me love. Praise self-love. Praise self-love. At this time, show yourself some love. Give yourself a hand clap. Praise the seconds. Praise the minutes. Praise the hours. Praise the days. Praise the months. Praise the weeks. Praise the years. Praise this journey. 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 Thank you. celebration of Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and his work and his the wonderful sounds of this band you see behind me they chilling right now that's what they <clears throat> think that's what they came for but they play a little bit too so if you guys can please put your hands again.
Town All Stars. Again, my name is Isaiah Anderson Jr. We are here celebrating our fourth annual, fourth annual celebration of Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and his dream and his 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 legacy. Um, and so we are going to get started. We would like to thank, first of all, let me thank uh, Seattle First Baptist Church for allowing us to be here. Can we just give them a round? Of So right now what we're going to do is a, uh, a welcome of some kind that is um, definitely needed. And so we're going to go right into it. And so right now, if you can please welcome Elder Cecile Hansen from the Duwamish tribe. Hi. <laughs> Happy New Year. We have to do that because we've got to wish for a Happy New Year, so mind sight. Anyway, uh, I am the chair of the Duwamish tribe and have been, and um, as you, if you know anything, that uh, we're an indigenous people of Seattle, so as I welcome everybody. <laughs> I want to uh, thank you for. Oh. Wow. <laughs> wow. Thank you, thank you. Well, I'm, I was just going to say thank you for the invite tonight regarding uh, human rights and, of course, uh, Martin Luther King's Day, which is on Monday, and it's supposed to be uh, a holiday, so you guys all stay home. <laughs> I mean, maybe some people will go to work. Uh, anyway, Lord God, you came to give honor to the least forgotten, overlooked, and misjudged. You come to give, O oh Lord, and pre pre prevent us from judging our brothers and sisters. O oh Lord, Prevent us from judging our brothers and sisters by the color of their skin, their country of origin, their sexual orientation, or their religion. Give us a vision to see each person as the Christ we love as children made in his image and worthy of his love and compassion. Let us not be blinded by either racism, racism prejudice, or excuse for taking advantage of another human being. We pray that we will not harden our hearts 
respond without thinking, nor reject another person because that person's skin is not the same color as ours. Accent sounds strange to us, and because that person looks different than us, give us the wisdom in examining our, our biased attitudes and ideas we have learned in the past. Dear Lord, when taught us, who taught us to be tolerant and, ch and charity? May we learn to respond to all that your people as our brothers and sisters. And I want to say amen. Is that my phone ringing? <laughs> I did, I'm sorry, I didn't shut it off, but at least I got through the prayer. <laughs> it is an amazing, uh, I just turned on TV today, I was doing home letters today at home on my computer about we are so tied into our phones. And as we know, we, we, we watch the children and, we, and adults, and we're walking around with our phones and we are addicted somehow to our phones. There, you want to take that somewhere? <laughs> Don't answer it. <laughs> and um, anyway, I can't apologize because I don't know who that's calling, but I'm telling you. <laughs> I just want to let you know I am so warm by that you're welcome tonight and hopefully that that we will have a wonderful holiday and a nice evening. And one, the last thing I want to share with you is finally, if God is for us, who can be against us? Roman 8, 31. Think about it. That's a good one. Yes. Who's against us? God is with us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now as the Native Drum Group uh, and ceremonial prayer comes, uh, is it Matt Romney? Matt Romney's going to come. You guys come on up. And you got to appreciate the elder because she kept it 100 with that flip phone, didn't she? Y'all didn't see it. It was a flip. <laughs> go head on. Matakiapi, Chante was there, Nape, choose up, Waki, and one at an amachiapi. Ya was slaha, a mataha yellow. Ate Wayagi, Charles Remley, Ina Wayagi, Donna Harrison, a Tokashila, Wakantaka, and Petukile, Wopila, and Petukile, Wawash de Yuha, Lena, Duamish Makocheki, Wopila Tanka, Duamish Oyate Gi. Awa wichak ya yo to kashila. Lena wichasha na wia gi o awa wichak ya yo. Mini wichoni gi oki ya yo. Good evening. My English name is Matt Remley. My Lakota name is Wakian Waanatan. And uh, these are my boys. And uh, we're up here to, uh, we're from Standing Rock, but living here in Seattle. And uh, first and foremost, want to give uh, thanks and acknowledgement to the Duwamish people in the Duwamish lands. Uh, even though I'm Lakota, I am uh, too a guest in the lands of the Duwamish people. And uh, thank you for the invitation to come share uh, a song tonight. And uh, uh, thank you. <clears throat>
Thank you. The first part that I found what it's saying is we're giving thanks uh, for life. And that even though we might have difficulties in our life, we're thankful for it because life itself is, is beautiful. And that second part of that song talks about standing up for and, and protecting Unchi Maka and Grandmother Earth. Have a good night. Talk about it. So if you can remain standing, please. I am now going to um, welcome to the stage Ms. Stefana Sneed, who is going to give us a rendition of the Star Spangled Banner, and then she is going to bless us with the Black National Anthem. And following her will be Council President Bruce Harrell, who will introduce our speakers. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the We're going to get through this together. Here we go.
Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, Stefana. And thank you for that non-introduction, Isaiah. My name is Bruce Harrell. I'll introduce myself. And first of all, thank you all for being here. We are here as family tonight to hear an exciting speaker who I'll introduce later. And before I introduce the mayor, let me do a few housekeeping things, if I may. I have several colleagues here, Councilmember Bagshaw, Councilmember O'Brien, Councilmember Herbold. I think I captured those that are in attendance. I saw some department heads here, Chief Best, I saw Chief Scoggins, I saw Miracle Lockhart, I saw a few other folks. And so I just wanted to recognize that if you look at the sponsors under our mayor's leadership, these folks, the departments, they look at their budget and they prioritize an event like this. So, um, so I think we should uh, at least recognize the sponsors and let's give them a hand for hosting this event. I'd like to just take a moment to introduce our mayor and you know I've been working with uh, Mayor Durkin now for um, I don't know almost a month and a half or so but I've known her since I was about 18 or 19 since uh, we had attended uh, no I guess about 20 21 I didn't start law school as 18 when we met in law school and so people are always what's what's she like what's she like to work with well I will sum it up by saying this where is she right now she's with us and she made it crystal clear that when she looked at our community in particular, she said, we have a lot of needs here in terms of affordability, being able to live in this city, in terms of social justice, in terms of mass incarceration, in terms of flat out racism and unfairness. And so her heart is in this game. And so we're going to hold her up. And I'll tell you, some of the stuff is not as cool and as sexy as that. We spent 30 minutes a day preparing for an earthquake. And what are the protocols? And we had to do that, all these uh, protocols we have to do as council president and as mayor. But aside from that kind of stuff, I am very, very confident that we're going to move the needle only like Seattle can do it. And by virtue of having our keynote speaker here, we are on our way. So I'd like to present to you our 56th mayor of Seattle, Mayor Jenny Durkin. Well, thank you. Thanks to everyone. Good evening. We can do better than that. Good evening. Now we're talking. Thank you for that kind introduction, uh, President Harrell, AKA Bruce. Um, and I want to thank everybody for the chance to be here tonight as we come together to start the celebrations of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. What a legacy. Um, the man has left all of us sitting here and so many who aren't in the struggle for equality that we are still in and we look at the horizon and we look at Washington DC and we wonder if that struggle will ever end but let us march on till victory is won it's not just a song it's what we have to do and I just want that singing was so wonderful. I mean, I just want to thank that, set the tone for all of us to know. Um, I'm also really, really honored to be here in the First Baptist Church. This church has such a storied place here in the city of Seattle and has always stood for what we're here tonight to remember and talk about um, and the fight for equality, the fight for justice. And so it's a great honor to be here. It's particularly great to be here. You know, the church was founded in 1869. This sanctuary, I think, was consecrated in 1912. And shortly after that, not too many years after that, a woman by the name of Bertha Landis was elected mayor of Seattle. She was the first woman mayor. And her chair sat empty for 92 years before a woman was elected mayor again. And so I know that every day each one of us in our own way has to rewrite the chapter of the struggle. We have to have the faith that those before us had that it can be better. We have to work together and we have to remember the call of Dr. King in all that we do because sometimes every day it's so easy to get up and be discouraged to think that things aren't better and won't get better 
but we have to remember they only get better if we try because we are that change that we command. Um, Ilyasa Shabazz, I just have to thank you for being here. What an honor it is for all of us to have you here. And I mean, what, what a remarkable honor to be here with this time. And I think about you know, the sacrifices that your family has made. And there are many families that that sacrifice and the ultimate sacrifice would turn them bitter turn them sad, and your career and the work you have done, what an amazing legacy, so thank you for being here. Um, I'll tell, it's kind of a funny story, so um, I was born here, grew up in Issaquah at the time, it was farm and country land, and when I was about 10 years old-ish, we all had to do a report on, if you weren't you, and you were a leader in America, who would you be? So you can imagine Issaquah in those days, and my teachers were very surprised when this red-headed, blue-eyed person got up and said, I am Malcolm X. <laughs> um, and we shared a birthday. We were both born on May 19th, and so my whole life I had been um, just f so fixated on the message in that time. And I think today, when we look at the turmoil of today, we have to remember we have lived turmoil as a nation before. We have fought injustice before. We will fight injustice again. We will not let Washington, D.C. or anyone else tell us what justice looks like. We will make it here right in Seattle. Yeah. So I don't want to talk too long because you didn't come to listen to your mayor. You came to listen to someone who has a, a voice and has written and talked and taught in a way that all of us have to learn from, and I'm looking forward to learning from it to do. But just want to say that I know as mayor that our work is unfinished. The message of Dr. King rings loudly, but does not ring true in so many lives. And we have to make it so it rings true for every life, for every person. And it starts here in Seattle in every neighborhood, in every connection, in every relationship, that we make sure that our city is one that stands for justice, that makes sure every part of our city knows that their children have the same opportunity as any other part of the city, that their children have the same opportunity in schools and employment, that their relationship with their police department can be strong, that they are not governed by fear, that they are not pushed out of the city, but that only happens if we work together. I'm proud, proud, proud and honored that you would let me talk to you all tonight as we kick off a weekend, a week of festivities that really should remind us it's not just a weekend, it's a commitment to justice. So thank you very much. Mr. Fuller, you are absolutely right. When we talk about the commitment to our country, I cannot forget our veterans and people like your family who sacrifice so much and you who come to so many places and so many meetings to remind us that that is part of what we need to do. So thank you, sir, very much. I appreciate that and I apologize. Um, we are going to continue on with the program. Thank you, Mayor, once again. Um, I'm going to bring a, a, a woman to the stage now who some of you know and some of you don't know. If you don't know, it's your fault. <laughs> Trust me, she's truly gifted. She's going to give us a selection uh, from her heart, and then we are going to hear from President Harrell again. <laughs> who is going to introduce our awesome speaker. So please put your hands together for Miss Josephine Howe. to this 
world as it spins around just don't let a spin get you down things are moving fast your feet Thank you, Josephine. The, our keynote speaker, who I'm about to introduce, hails from New York right now, but see, she didn't know we had that kind of soul up here in Seattle. <laughs> and see, these guys, Butch, Lonnie, John, these guys, we hang out once a week. We're not going to tell you where. We hang out once a week, and they know what I'm talking about. Uh, you guys have honored us with your, your, your music and the message, and that was a... That a um, old Donnie Hathaway song? What was it? Old Donnie Hathaway song. 
trying to establish my credibility here because I, <laughs> I didn't Google it. So uh, some of you old folks were around in 1965 when the world was shaken, February 21st, 1965, when El Hajj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X was assassinated. Um, our keynote speaker was a couple of years old, and her entire life, she's of course had to live knowing that pain that affected this world, affected the world. And in her own right, she's been an author, um, a lecturer, an activist, an educator, uh, talking about the power of history, the power of love, the power of community. So we're very honored uh, to have Ilyasa Shabazz here. Now I'll tell you her, bio her biography is in the uh, program, so I won't read it. I will just mention a few things that uh, she holds a uh, Bachelor of Science in Biology from State University of New York, New Paltz, and a Master's of Science in Education and Human Resource Development from Fordham University. Um, many of her books have been nationally acclaimed. Um, she um, gets, you know, I've just spent uh, some hours during the day with her today, but it's just incredible how she, um, how graceful she is with uh, who she is and what she's done. And I know she's going to talk a little bit about our, our history, her history, and equally important, our future. So uh, as only a Seattle soulful community can do, let's give her a round of applause as we welcome Elyasa Shabazz. very much. I didn't know Patti LaBelle was going to be here. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry, I met Josephine and the other young bird. Beautiful, beautiful. I teach American cultural pluralism and the law at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City, and I can honestly say that I love my students. It's why I do the work that I do. My parents instilled specific values in their children. I learned about the significant contributions of people of the African diaspora. I learned about the significant contributions of women. And I learned about the significant contributions of Muslims. I learned that in order to love others, you have to first love yourself. And so it's important to me that my students also understand that they are a reflection of me, and I a reflection of them, and that we are interconnected and responsible for one another. And so I'm always researching polls and statistics on our young people so I can stress the importance of one's identity and the importance of having a value system. There's one poll that stands out from all the rest, and I share it when the opportunity arises. It's a poll I found several years ago that was conducted on adolescents who were asked, what would you like to be when you grow up? Their answer was quite simple, and I quote, rich. Not rich in service, not rich in helping anyone, but just rich. And when I think of the founding of this new country, the indigenous Native Americans, slavery, Jim Crow, the civil rights movement, mass incarceration of our young, and all of what comprises our modern American history and culture. I can't help but to think of the founding forefathers and foremothers. I cannot help but to think of those who were decimated, those who suffered their entire lives, those who, in spite of the man-made obstacles, rallied against injustice, those who endured lifetimes of psychological trauma. 
all of those who lost their lives in the struggle so that each and every human being that has the opportunity today to realize his full potential. I am a reflection of you, and you are a reflection of me. The challenge is to see us as one, to have compassion and care for anyone whose human rights are violated, so we may right the wrongs of our society once and for all. It's not a matter of black and white. It's a matter of right and wrong. We adults are responsible for who our children become. When a large population of our children say that all they want in life is to be rich, we must ask ourselves, what happened? What happened to our humanity, to our compassion? What brought us to a place of individualism, where personal wealth and gain are favored over collective rights and well-being? where tolerance and hope are trumped. <laughs> by hate and fear. We have the power and the responsibility to reject what is being imposed by the current administration and supporters. We are a country that cares and not just about our personal well-being, but about the conditions of our communities and the world at large. And so my premise is simple. Much like our foreparents who challenged injustice issues, I believe that every child must have the opportunity to be their greatest selves, to conquer all obstacles that stand in their way, to be inspired, and motivated and believe that they are worthy of self-love, that they are worthy of a quality education, that they have every right to realize his and her true potential so they may ultimately participate in the mainstream of society as full-fledged American citizens. You see, much like Dr. King, each and every one of us has a legacy. To Mayor Jenny Durkin, God bless you. To the City Council, City Council President Bruce Harrell and his beautiful wife. City Council members, community leaders, and friends, I am honored to be here with you in your great city of Seattle at this beautiful and historic First Baptist Church as a daughter of Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz, and to celebrate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King through the lens of race and social justice, as also modeled by my parents. My mother and Aunt Coretta were dear friends. I'm always grateful to reflect on the King family, on Bernice, Dexter, Martin, and the late Yolanda, and to ask God to continue to bless and protect them. I'm specifically grateful for the bond Betty, Coretta, and Megger Evers' wife, Merle Evers, shared, for the support they had in one another, they call themselves the Three Musketeers. So you can imagine what they did in behind closed doors with one another. Their bond epitomized true sisterhood. Most people still don't know that before my father was gunned down, he and Dr. King embraced one another. They were two very young, dedicated men seeking justice for their people seeking an egalitarian future for all residents and citizens. Malcolm and Martin respected one another. When Dr. King was arrested in 1965, it was my father who went to Selma. After
after speaking to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, he informed on Coretta that he supported Dr. King wholeheartedly. And he told the power structure, if Dr. King was not released from jail, that he and his organization in the North was the alternative. <laughs> and we know, <laughs> we know that Malcolm was serious. We know that he was uncompromising when it came to realizing solutions to end the historic and systemic miserable conditions that existed for his people. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The only way to end these injustices ladies and gentlemen, is to look at the truths, the struggles, the journey of Dr. King and all of those young leaders who precede us and be inspired by their determination and integrity to find solutions to the human condition that would be filled with such hate to oppress and torture its citizens. One of my favorite speeches of my father's is his debate at Oxford University with an audience of students about achieving peace, liberties, and freedom. And he quotes William Shakespeare's Hamlet to help the young people understand their roles, their pivotal roles in society. And he quoted, to be or not to be, that is the question whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them. Even today, we have young unarmed black citizens brutalized, shot, and even killed by police officers under questionable circumstances. We have Muslims whose religions are synonymous with terrorism when we know it is a religion of peace. We have women and men, girls and boys, coming forth with testimonies of sexual assaults. We have witnessed the judicial response to protests by the people continue to be a string of grand jury, non-indictments, and acquittals. However, as protesters, there's a segment of young leaders who are following in the steps of Dr. King, who are expressing discontent and demanding change with skillful use of social media to rapidly organize and educate the masses on important human rights issues. I think it's also important to understand that just because one has tweeted a social hashtag does not make you an activist or a social change agent. Like those activists before us, we must have a well thought out goal, a plan, a strategy to getting from point A to Z. We must have a measurable goal or we will have accomplished nothing. We will protest, we will march, we will sing in the name of something, but when the songs are over, the marching has died down, we've accomplished nothing. And so what I learned from the civil rights movement is that people came together with their voices. They had discussions. They had check marks for accomplishing goals first and foremost. Dr. King sought solutions. My father sought solutions. He continuously counseled smart action, cautioning against false moves and the folly of running in place thinking one is making progress when the problem still exists 50 years later. And so it's important that we take the time to understand our history 
and look to the generations of young leaders like Dr. King and nameless young people and continue the legacy of dynamic leadership. When young people were demonstrating marches and protests, for example, wanting to integrate restaurants and schools, housing, my father came along and said, we demand our human rights as your brother. He said, we demand our human rights ordained by God. Yes, he was a fearless man because he served God. He feared that on Judgment Day, the Lord would ask, what did you do with your life? How have you honored me? How have you honored your brothers and sisters? Well, Malcolm redefined the American Civil Rights Movement to include a human rights agenda. He circled the globe tirelessly in search of solutions to the human condition that would oppress its fellow brother, sister, and children because of their melanin in their skin and because of the mineral resources of their land. He read everything he could get his hands on so he was properly prepared to educate the masses. He told us that we Americans were a miseducated nation and our salvation lie in understanding the truths in history. He internationalized the struggle for freedom, justice, and independence, providing a blueprint for any oppressed group seeking social justice and equality. This uncompromising dedication of Malcolm X and Dr. King, international figures by the time they were in their mid-30s. And today, social climate is informing this generation of the harsh realities borne by Frederick Douglass, Paul Robeson, Sam Cooke, Fannie Lou Hamer, Malcolm X, Dr. Martin Luther King. Amen, brother. Yes, that's right. Sometimes we complain that we no longer have effective leaders, but ladies and gentlemen, we are those leaders that we seek. And so we know if we want change, the only way we're going to get it is when we get up off of our behinds and, and do it. As a daughter of two human rights activists, I was raised understanding the importance of education and history, the importance of humanity, the importance of leadership, that I am my brother and sister's keeper. As a child, I recall watching my mother working in the cause of human rights. I remember her participating in the International Women's Conference that was held in China shortly before she passed away. And so writing my first book, Growing Up X, afforded me an opportunity to reflect on her life as a source of inspiration and empowerment that I wanted very much to share with others. My mother was a very young woman when she witnessed the political assassination of her husband. And one week prior, a bomb was thrown into the nursery of our home, where my sisters and I slept as babies. Much like Aunt Coretta, when my father was killed, my mother was left traumatized, frightened, and alone. She was a young woman with four babies and pregnant with my youngest sisters, the twins. I've often asked myself, with six babies, widowed, and the wife of a man who challenged a government that was historically unjust to its own people, how were these young women able to overcome such a loss and so many obstacles and still raise their children with a specific value system and still dedicate their lives to giving back to others while safeguarding their husbands' legacies for the sake of future generations having the opportunities entitled to all human beings that were denied in their lifetime. My mother had six babies, and she went on to earn a master's degree. She got into her car once a week and drove from our home in New York 
to UMass at Amherst and she earned a PhD. How was she able to find the strength and determination to do so? She never accepted no or I can't as an answer for herself. She survived because of her faith in God and because she knew the importance of self-respect, self-esteem, and a quality education. She knew that if she didn't do it, she most certainly wasn't going to sit back and complain and hope that someone else would do it. Accurate information and a quality education reinforced her leadership capabilities. And she raised six girls with the knowledge of history as a means to develop a healthy identity, self-respect, and with an understanding of an obligation to others. Forget what they say about pulling yourselves up by your own bootstraps. If you look around, it does not work. I am a reflection of you, and you a reflection of me. And so we must subscribe to that African proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child and raise our children. Like Dr. King, my father accepted the mantle of leadership in the human rights struggle because he understood the oneness of man. That no matter where we're from, Asia, Africa, Europe, no matter our sex, creed, or sexual orientation, that we are all one, brothers and sisters under the family of God. And he shared the truths that history of black, African, people of color did not begin in slavery, but that refined and industrious African men and women were the architects of civilizations whose monuments are continually being uncovered by archaeologists today. But no one will know this until we do something about it and claim our history, and claim our identity for the sake of our children, and for the sake of all children, so that other children can respect children that look like me. And then I can respect others. But it's not going to happen until the truths are documented. We cannot continue to turn a blind eye. When we are provided with educational facts that Africans were not simply slaves before they were captured, but that they were refined and industrious African men and women with identities, families, friends, careers, we can respect ourselves and respect differences and rid the untruths that encourage disdain and disregard and disrespect. My father provided faces, names, and a history to those who cultivated this barren land that we now have the opportunity to call the United States of America our home. And this is why young people organized amongst themselves to say that black lives matter. The truth of our identity matters. The truth of our culture matters. The truth of our significant contribution to world history matters. And this is not to say that other lives don't matter. It says that we are a miseducated nation that we have been calculatedly, is that the right word, calculatedly? <laughs> Miseducated, calculatedly or calculatively? <laughs> what, what is the word? <laughs> Tively. <laughs> Intentionally. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> <laughs> we have been intentionally miseducated about the historical truths of black life. That if we are given a month to celebrate black history, 
In actuality, you're saying that our history is not worthy of inclusion in our educational curriculum throughout the year. <laughs> that the Holocaust of African people doesn't matter, right? So oftentimes I ask people, who heard of the European Jewish Holocaust? Raise your hand. That's, a, I mean, wow. Be and who heard of the African Holocaust? One, two, three. And so this is the thing. The African Holocaust happened right here in this country. The European Jewish Holocaust didn't happen. It happened in Europe. But every child and elder person, they know about the European Jewish Holocaust because they teach the world about it and they vow never to forget the significant crime committed against their humanity. They teach their children at a very young age what it is to be Jewish, and they thrive. They teach the world to respect them. And so when we look at the African Holocaust and no one heard of it, we have to ask ourselves why. We have to do the same thing. So we need to call up our Jewish friends and ask them for some help. <laughs> when it comes to discussions on Africa, blacks, and history, oftentimes we say it's not important. That it was a long ago. Oh, that stuff, that slavery stuff, that was a long time ago. Get over it. We achieved Dr. King's dream. In fact, a Washington Post columnist Eugene Robinson wrote, there was a time when there were agreed upon black leaders, when there was a clear black agenda, when we could talk confidently about the state of black America, right? Because it's a part of all America. Everybody talks about their issues, but not anymore. Not after decades of desegregation, affirmative action, and urban decay. Not after globalization decimated the working class and trickled down economics, sorted the nation into winners and losers. Not after the biggest wave of the black emigration from Africa and the Caribbean since slavery. Not after most people ceased to notice or much less care. When a black man and a white woman walked down the street hand in hand, these are among the forces and trends that have the, had the unattended consequences of tearing black America to pieces. Well, I was a project advisor for the award-winning PBS film, and I came here, and I don't even remember which university it was. It might have been University of, I don't know, but you probably know. <laughs> And, um, and, and it was about the, it was a phenomenal production, Prince Among Slaves. It was a PBS award-winning film. And has anyone ever heard of it, Prince Among Slaves? The only thing is, you know, I, I thought it was phenomenal, right? But there was one part when it came to the image of seeing the young man learning, he was sitting on a tree stump, when we know that, the, that that's not what Africa looked like in the 1700s. It had these enormous structures and people were, it was thriving and colorful. But aside of that, it was a great production. And Prince Abdurrahman was one of the most famous Africans who, were ever, who was captured in the history of the slave trade. You see, we were accustomed to relying on textbooks written by others to inform and educate us. And we stumbled upon the writings of this enslaved African prince, a real prince, not you know, one of those princes with the grass skirts and all this stuff, but a real prince. And it was his perspective that was documented in the 1700s. Prince Abdurrahman recounts his observation of this new land. He said that the United States in the 1700s was by no means comparable to the land in Africa from where he was kidnapped. As early as the 1700s, this great prince indicated that the United States was underdeveloped. 
that it was a pagan society, that the homes were poorly constructed by comparison to the enormous granite rock structures built in Africa. Now, who, how many of us knew this? Well, I knew too, because my mother made sure I learned. <laughs> but no matter how much we learn, we need that image to believe it, unfortunately, because we are all product of what the media tells us. In the 1700s, this great prince, Abdurrahman, said that most Africans spoke five to seven languages. And they say the more language you speak, the more compassion you get. So make sure you teach your children at a very young age, make sure they learn languages. That thriving cultures were based upon universal spirit and intellect, God and scholarship, morale and wisdom. And it was these African men, women, and children who were kidnapped from their homes, from their families, communities, and jobs. And you know, I had a friend, a Nigerian friend, who said to me, he said, Ilyasa, when I was a little boy, I heard about those Negroes in America. I never knew they were our lost ancestors. So there was this complete disconnect. And they were shipped to the New World to cultivate the barren land, leaving their land and people behind. In our journey toward justice, we must ensure history properly and accurately honors them. Because if we don't, that means that their life, I mean, what does it mean? Right? This is why I do the work that I do. I, had a, I was talking to a young woman um, earlier, and we spoke about not having children and the, the different paths that we took in our lives. She worked in corporate America. And I said, well, I didn't work in corporate America. My commitment is to make sure that I honor my ancestors properly. There's no way I could die not having done something. Honor my ancestors and do something for future generations. And this is the reason why I write books and this is the reason why I teach and I love my students, I really do. And so I believe that this is how we construct and encourage a mighty legacy of our own with intellect and morality, with fairness, care, and compassion, with truth and a cohesive value system. I pray that we will be fortified with the understanding that knowledge of accurate historical information prepares us for leadership in our homes, it prepares us for leadership in our communities and around the world. It fosters self-respect and then respect for others. It instills in us strength, compassion, and the ability to see right from wrong. It reminds us of whom we are at our core and all of what we can accomplish together. As the future leaders of this new world, sitting back and waiting for someone else to do for us is no longer an option. And we have to make sure that we instill this in our children. With all of our talents, skills, and access, we must rely on ourselves to get these jobs done. We can't complain if we're not going to do anything about it, because then it's just idle gossip, right? We must come together with like minds, with the shared goal of freedom, liberty, and justice for all, establish clubs, meeting groups, organizations, plan, strategize, organize amongst yourselves, and execute. People are always asking me, how do we do it? Like Nike said, just do it, right? Accurate historical facts lead to a clear understanding that we cannot suppress another without oppressing ourselves, that we cannot come to the aid of another without helping ourselves. If we do not know history in its entirety, then our education is incomplete, and we and all the children following will continue to suffer the disorder of detachment, separation from history, disconnection from culture, 
rejection of heritage and very likely a life without true passion, determination, and purpose. Wanting simply to be rich, not rich in service, not rich in helping anyone, but just rich. Amassing material possessions, relying on someone else to tell us of our worth. You know, sometimes we compromise and we know we shouldn't to have certain friends or to have certain boy friends or husbands or whatever it is. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But you know, so we need to have all our value system and everything in line. So relying on someone else to tell us of our worth without ever recognizing that we are already an authentic jewel worthy of shining our light just as we are. <laughs> my father said, when you teach a man, this is my favorite, you teach a community. My father was a very young man, you guys. You know, he was only in his 20s when the world learned of him. He was 39 when he was killed. And look at all of what he did. I mean, you know, and to say that he was all of the things that he was not, he was a very caring, loving, compassionate man. If he wasn't, he would not have done this work for free. He was brilliant. There's so many things that he could have done and still lived. You know, so he was just a really great man. And, it, and, and it's awful, you know, that all of the negative stuff that was put out there about him you know, was put there. And, and, and I tell you, I went to private school in Camper in Vermont with Quakers and, you know, the peace movement. And when it came time for me to go to college and, and people thought that I was going to deliver them out of something, I was so, I was a little, you know, a little introverted. You know, I knew how to say, just say no to drugs. <laughs> right? Say no to teenage pregnancy. Right? But I had to find my power so that I could make sure, once my mother passed away, that I could step in her shoes and protect her husband's, safeguard his legacy. And, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't so that Malcolm X could shine and be famous or anything like that. It was the work that he did could empower future generations, right? His work was serious, and it meant everything to him. And I loved both of my parents so much. I am so fortunate that I had a mother who loved me unconditionally. She rarely said no to me. She loved me unconditionally, and so I have that love unconditional for others, for strangers. I used to bring strangers into our house, and my mother was like, oh my gosh, you know? Because my mother was amazing, just loving, good person. And you feel when you grow up with people like that in your household, you think the world is that way. And then you find out that is not the case, and you're grateful for the good people that come your way. So my father said, when you teach a man, you teach a community. And when you teach a woman, you raise a nation. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And so, um, um, gentlemen, 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 we, we need you to remember that, please. <laughs> we need you to see us for who we are, yeah. right? We need you to protect us and, you know, all those kinds of things. It's, it's sometimes, you know, I've been told by young people who are binary gender, they don't need a man to protect them, right? But it's important that you understand who we are because we understand who you are and we know that you need attention and you need to be held up really high, right? So we will give you that reinforcement. 
But we must prepare future leaders to answer the call to leadership, to give 110% and fulfill a more purpose-driven life. If we don't do it, it's not going to happen. And if we look at our children and we have any complaints about them, it is our fault. So if we want our children to be better, we have to do better. And look at Kaepernick's mother, who supported and what he's doing, who applauded his acts. We must commit ourselves to building strong, safe, and respectable communities. Young men must protect and guide their women, and women will understand their role in nation building so that we can demonstrate to the world that we too are the sons and daughters of promise. And yes, we smart, forward-thinking adults will stand tall, gleaming with pride with this young, bold generation of leaders whom we are preparing to take their place in history and define a legacy of their own as the caregivers, the teachers, authors, screenwriters, policymakers, artists, poets. As future leaders, when our youth are studying for exams, we have to make sure that they're not only memorizing text or taking classes just to pass but that they study so that they're equipped to be their very best. If their goal is to be a doctor, we have to remind them not to study medicine for social status, but become a doctor to ensure that all people will have adequate health care. We have to instill these values in our children. We have to do that. Right? If your goal is to be an attorney, do not study law to buy a bigger home, but become a lawyer so you can fight all forms of injustice. And if you are committed to social justice, then whether you are a lawyer, doctor, mayor, pastor, black, white, straight, gay, or binary gender, your purpose and service will be to improve upon and give back to society in some significant manner. As parents, leaders, teachers are preparing their young to take their place in history so they may define a legacy of their own. And when we do that, we will stand worthy to honor and understand the Congolese Queen Nzinga, who was the military strategist in the year of the 1600s that ever confronted the armed forces of Portugal against Angola. In the 1600s, this Congolese Queen's aim was the total destruction of the slave trade. We will stand together worthy to say thank you to Kwame Nkrumah, Patrice Lumumba, Stephen Biko, Nelson Mandela, Winnie Mandela. We will stand together worthy to honor Toussaint Louverture, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who as African revolutionary generals and their brothers and sisters in bondage took a stance in the 1800s and overthrew their French oppressors and claimed their freedom and land in Haiti. We will stand together here in the United States to honor Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Denmark Vesey, Nat Turner, W.B. Du Bois, Solomon Northup, David Walker, Fannie Lou Hamer, who challenged injustice with every beat of their heart. We will stand worthy with the great historians Carter G. Woodson, John Henry Clark, Dr. Sheikh, and Tadio, J.A. Rogers, who dedicate their lives to teach the truth and legacies of first world nations and document it for future generations. Let us stand worthy and honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and all of the nameless Americans, the nameless past laborers, 
so that we could be here today to follow in their footsteps of principle and service. And as we pay tribute to the power of leadership that is within each and every one of you, may you emulate the wisdom, courage, and purpose of the legacy before you to produce the best in yourselves that mankind can offer, and womankind. When we honor ourselves, we prepare the next generation as we set examples of leadership, truth, and justice, just as those who labored before you. And I believe it is then as a nation that our blessings will truly reign. We are a reflection of one another. I can stand here and say that I genuinely love you, unless you do something bad. <laughs> I can honestly say that this is why we must celebrate and honor Dr. Martin Luther King. Thank you. gentleman said, you didn't tell them that Malcolm said, only a fool would let his enemy educate his children. So, I told you so. I told you we're in for a treat. So we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to do two things. We're going to first invite the mayor back up just to read a short uh, piece of proclamation. Then we're going to talk to you. We're going to do a little questions and answers, a little Q&A. Uh, we've had a, a little appetite for that. We're going to do it long. We're gonna, should, don't ask me any questions like you did last time. <laughs> this is for our honored uh, guest. And Mayor Dirk, will you just bring the proclamation? Because we did um, have the full council and the mayor, we do a few things together, that we had a proclamation, and, um, and I'll read a whereas. Uh, whereas today we are gathered to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day and honor Dr. King's legacy of patriotic leadership in the struggle to secure equal rights for all Americans. And whereas, Dr. Sam? Well, we have made great progress. We know that significant disparities still exist in our country our state and city, and we must come together to continue to pursue Dr. King's vision for our nation and... And whereas the city of Seattle is dedicated to eradicating racial and other systemic inequities within our institutions and our entire community. And whereas Seattle is a welcoming city for all people, and we stand together with our immigrant and refugee neighbors and friends, and whereas today we remember Dr. King's words, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And we commit to making our vision of equity, opportunity, and inclusiveness a reality for all. Now therefore, Mayor Jenny A. Durkin and the entire Seattle City Council hereby proclaim January 11th, 2018 to be Martin Luther, Luther King, King Jr. Unity, Unity Day. Day. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Honorable. And I want to recognize uh, Council Member, former Council Member, uh, Kirsten Harris Tally here, if my eyesight is correct here. I'm getting a little old. 
So uh, we have some spotters for some questions. Tally, would you like to join us, sir? One of our fine educators. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate, Sister Shabazz, what you've presented today. The first question that I have for you is, um, we seem to be in a world in which uh, black self-determination means something is done to the white body, where if we succeed, it's at their cost. How, would you, how do you think about black self-determination in light of the white body today? Well, I don't think I think like that. For me, I am determined to do whatever I set out to do. And so that's it. You know, I don't think about the white body or the black body or the black self-determination or the white self-determination. If there's something I want to accomplish, I am going to accomplish it. I set out to do whatever is necessary. Any other questions? I see some hands here. And if you could just, how would you like to use the mics? Can we bring the mic to them? Very good. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, I appreciate the fact that you really centered youth in the speech that you gave this evening. And as you know, in our town, we are fortunate to have the opportunity to use restorative justice practices in alternative sentencing opportunities for youth in detention. So I'm very proud to be in a city that is willing to open itself to the opportunity to use this process to recognize, listen, and appreciate our youth and support them in the opportunity to go forward in their lives after they've had the opportunity to self-reflect. So I'm honored and appreciative of that. And I'm hoping that you could share with us, and especially the leaders and community here today, um, your advice, your support and suggestions of further things that we can do to complement our efforts, to support our youth in detention, our youth for whom there is the potential that they will become those who are unfortunate enough to experience the criminal justice system in the United States of America. So I would appreciate if you could share with us some words of wisdom for our youth who are having this experience um, and also those with power in the room who have the opportunity to affect their lives in a very positive Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Thank you. If we have the power to help our children, we have to. Thank you. I mean, for as, young, for as long as I can remember, when I was in high school, it was in an all-girls prep school. It was a boring school. And every Wednesday, we went to children's village and we tutored and we mentored people. They were basically our age, but we taught them. They were in lockup facilities. When I went to college, I went and worked at a lockup facility. It is very difficult for me to imagine a child not having love, direction, guidance. And if someone has the wherewithal I can't imagine, what are, you, what are you doing, right? It's extremely important. If our children are in a detention center, then there should be a program that's offering to rehabilitate them, right? Not just put in a place and babysat, but making sure that they're getting education, counseling, mentoring, and everything else that's necessary, you know? A mentor is, it doesn't, it is not difficult to do. So I, I can't imagine that young children would be locked up with no one to guide them, mentor them, tutor them, hug them, care for them, direct them. I can't imagine that. Your next question is here. Thank you everybody for putting this together. Earlier today, 
I go, I wish I was dead. Because I read President Trump say, shit whole countries. When you say you don't know what it's like to be white, I am glad. When you are born in America, you don't know a lot. But you always think you know everything. And they say that the wise man listens to everybody because he thinks he can learn from somebody. But the foolish man doesn't listen to anybody because he thinks he knows it all. I have given everything to this country. And when you talk about speaking languages, having compassion, I go, yeah, I used to speak six languages. I narrowed it to three because it was confusing. I came when Reagan was president. I never had the term people of color in my life. In Nigeria, we don't have white people ruling anything. <laughs> when I went to school, we, have, we, we refer to people as American, British, this, that. We don't know people of color. I'm not telling you we're above, we have our own tribalism. But I didn't grow up in Nigeria, I grew up in Sierra Leone. In Sierra Leone, I was, I, mean, I was born in Islamic home, but I went to Christian schools. But I always feel like, oh, I'm cool. I can be Christian, I can be Muslim, just switch God every time. Then I came to America, I said, I want to be Jewish. One of those will get me to heaven. But I am glad you say what you said about the Nigerian because Americans have a hate relationship with us. They hate the fact that we speak out. But then the Christian evangelicals, they love us because we believe in God. As terrible as we are, check the Bible. We learn everything from the Jews. I didn't want to, I, my, I went, they just gave me this today and I go, this woman is coming, I've read about your dad. And I'm like, and the relationship with Martin Luther King, sometimes I envy you guys that I want to be part of you. Because when you come to America, let me tell you what we do. Every day we wake up, how much American do I want to be today? <laughs> Every situation. And when you're an immigrant, three questions. You have an accent, where are you from? Then you say, are you going to go back? No. You don't like it here? You say, oh, I'm going to say, all these damn foreigners, they don't go back. Do you understand English? I go, no. Where did you learn English? On the airplane. <laughs> so we, I am glad to listen to you because Seattle, I've given a lot to you, but you haven't given to me. Oregon gave me false image of America. When I came here, I've never been in white country. My scholarship didn't come. Oregonians took me in. At Oregon State University, I was all over the map. Go check my record, I'm on the... I came to Seattle. I've been trying to do a lot. I appreciate you. I will contact you because Trump is doing a lot, but he's reflecting what Americans think. Thank you. I spent a lot of time in Nigeria. It's a great place to be. And boy, I tell you, when you go there, you realize that I must be from Nigeria. You see, it's really amazing. I wanted to thank you um, for being here this evening. And um, I want to really get this right. Because um, your father said, by any means necessary. And I was wondering at that time when he, okay, <laughs> you know how you grew into whatever it was that he taught you. And I'm wondering, when did you realize by any means necessary? Do you remember by any means necessary, whether he said it to you or you heard it out in public and what it meant to you? Well, he didn't say it to me. 
Um, he, and, you know, he didn't say it to his family. But what does it mean? It means, you know, for a long time, we were docile. We were in the dark. Because we were told that we were nothing, that God put us on this earth to be slaves and to serve our masters. We were told that we didn't have a history, we didn't have an identity, we didn't have a culture, we had nothing. But then we found out that it was a lie. So my father tried to wake us up to our humanity. When he said the white man was a devil, he didn't mean that, but he needed to shock reality into us. Because here we were wanting to be everything that was white and detesting everything about who we were because we were told that we were nothing. So when my father said, by any means necessary, he meant we needed to stand up on our feet and defend ourselves. We need to make sure that we're teaching our children. We need to make sure that we have education. We don't need to go and ask someone, can we come, can we integrate into this restaurant? Can we have a quality education? We have to say, we want our children to be properly educated. That we had to be men, we had to be women, by any means necessary. He wasn't a violent man, right? Because the violence was happening to us. We were being firebombed and lynched and everything else. So by any means necessary means stop people from being bullies and, and you know, doing all the things that they're doing to us that's preventing us from realizing our full potential. So by any means necessary means get a good education, get a good job, good family, good husband, wife, whatever you want, have your children, get a good house, and everything else. My father's father, the reason their home was, was burned to the ground is because he purchased land that was reserved for whites. Because he wanted that land. And he thought, you can't, you know, you, you can't tell me that I can't purchase land if I have money to purchase it. So by any means necessary means, you know, realize your hum humanity. Be, be a complete human being. So our last question is Okay. Um, well, if you're like the one black boy in elementary school in the third grade, and you have a white teacher, and the, a person's bothering you, and they always say, um, come and tell them first. When I tell them, they don't do nothing. And then when they do something to me and I have to get them off of me, they say to the person who's bothering me, are you okay? You know, I want to know what should you do in that situation. So first of all, yeah. just I'm going to the school. What school you go to, Marcel? I'll see you there tomorrow, Pepper. Dearborn Park Elementary. I will be there. The mayor said that she wanted to go to the school. Huh? The mayor said that she wants to go to the school. The mayor said she wants to go to? So the mayor, myself and the mayor, and some NAACP for we just gonna go. So we want to make sure that That's you right. all right at Dearborn Park in the third grade by yourself. I'm letting you know you're not by yourself. You hear me? You're not by yourself. We will be there. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful experience to be here with you in this great city of Seattle, and I look forward to returning. And I'm so happy that he has people to come. All right, Isaiah Anderson, take us home. You guys, can we give it up one more time for our guest speaker, please?
I want to make sure we, we thank all of our sponsors, the Mayor's Office of City of Seattle, the Seattle City Council, Seattle, the, the City Attorney, the City Clerk. Uh, we had the Office of Arts and Culture, City of Seattle City Light, Central Budget Office. We had the Seattle Office of Civil Rights, Office of Economic Development, Department of Education and Early Learning, Office of Emergency Management, Seattle Fire Department, Human Service Department, um, Department of Neighborhoods, Seattle Parks and Recreation, Seattle Department of Human Resources, Seattle Police Department, Seattle Center, Seattle Housing Authority, Seattle Public Utilities, and Seattle Information Technology. You guys, we want to thank you for coming out. My name is Isaiah Anderson, Jr., and once again, the city has done us well with our guest speaker, has done us well with the celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., so until next time, peace and God bless.